Can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me now? Good, okay. I'll get started. Uh, my name's Kurt Gray. I'm a solutions architect here with AWS in the Global Financial Services Group. Uh, we're a vertical within AWS that helps large financial institutions adopt the AWS platform, where it's new workloads or migrating workloads. Um, in that space, obviously, compliance is a big topic. Um, making sure everything they're doing in AWS meets their compliance requirements. Um, in financial services, compliance means many things. If you're uh, in banking, you're subject to the OCC regulations. If you're giving out loans, you have to make sure your lending practices comply with the Fair Lending Act. If you are uh, you know, holding deposits or you have investment portfolios, you, you probably have to do the Dodd-Frank stress testing to make sure you can, your institution can take on heavy economic shocks. So all of that is, you know, industry compliance around business processes and the health of your firm. Um, but of course in AWS, when we talk about compliance, we're talking about IT governance and um, managing access to data, managing access to systems, and mostly just making sure your IT systems are well governed. So we have a lot of customers in financial services who, you know, they, they do deploy workloads on AWS that help them comply with their business practices, for example, do economic shock testing and so on. Um, but also in AWS, they also have to make sure that their workloads are meet the usual IT compliance frameworks, uh, such as these. So when we talk about compliance in AWS and IT governance, usually it's in reference to these types of governance frameworks, depending on your workload and what countries, what part of the world you're doing this in. Uh, is going to determine your scope. So on our uh, compliance website, you will see our information on how we align our security practices to these and other governance frameworks. Um, uh, not just these, but you know many others. Uh, we also have an artifact website that you can reach from within your AWS web console where you can download our third-party audit reports where our auditors have you know, looked at our controls and our practices and provided their input on our alignment with these and other frameworks. So while we have you know, certifications and attestations for the AWS platform along these frameworks, of course, just because we have information on uh, you know, our alignment with PCI controls, for example. Obviously, it doesn't mean that everything you put in AWS is automatically PCI compliant because AWS is PCI compliant. Uh, of course, it also it has to do with proving to your auditors that the controls that are within your control are aligned to the PCI framework. So we explain it this way through our shared responsibility model um, when it comes to security, where supposing you know you want to get uh, PCI certified or SOC or so on, um, there are aspects of those control frameworks that speak to the on-premises controls, the facilities controls, etc. So you refer to the AWS attestation of those controls Whereas the things that are within your control, um, you explain to your auditor what you're doing to control those aspects that are within your control. So we have a lot of customers who do have PCI certified workloads in AWS. They are processing payments um, and they are aligned with other uh, frameworks. And this is how they do it. They show their auditors our attestations and they show their auditors evidence of the controls for everything that's in their control. 
So we're often asked, uh, you know, how, where do I start my compliance journey on AWS? Um, how is it different than how we're doing it in our corporate data center on-prem? How's it any different? Well, it often starts here with your control mappings. So we asked a lot of our customers, what are you using for your GRC software, your governance, risk, and compliance tracking? Um, and there's applications out there that, that help you do these control mappings, but a lot of our customers will tell us, well, it comes down to an Excel sheet. So it's pretty common if you're using Excel sheets for this, don't, don't feel bad, a lot of people in the industry are. Um, but this is a kind of a small scale example of what such an Excel sheet looks like where you basically, you state what the risk is, you state what the requirement is for controlling that risk, and then you, in the next column, you have references to the control framework references that have that requirement. And then further down the sheet, you put uh, how you're doing it on-prem and how you're doing it in AWS. So to answer the question, how do we approach this in AWS, it's pretty much the same as what you do in your corporate data centers already is you have your controls framework and you state the map of what the control is and where the evidence is. And you do the same in AWS. So if it's an Excel sheet, it's like you're adding more rows practically. Um, so why lay it out this way? Because generally an auditor is gonna come to you and say, what are you doing to control access to customer data? Kind of a broad question, which has 300 answers to it. Um, so how do you find which answers and how do you produce the evidence? Well, you, you kind of know the category of risk they're asking about. They might drill down into the requirement that you have to disable inactive employee logins. Um, it's helpful to have the references of the compliance framework references for that specific requirement. And then all the way down the sheet as to where to get the evidence, who owns that system, who can prove to the auditor that you're actually meeting that requirement? So again, it's kind of a small scale example, but that's some of the practical side of how do you show IT governance. So for the remainder of this talk, I wanna talk about design for compliance, which is once you've gone through this experience, you might go back and look at your systems differently and your processes, and you might think, how could we have built this up differently to have made this process easier. Because this is just one requirement. Obviously, there are thousands of IT governance requirements. So when you step back from that experience and you ask, how could we have designed our systems differently to have made this gone easier? That's what design for compliance is all about, is kind of designing backwards from the audit. So for the remainder of this talk, I want to use as an example user access management, particularly employee access management, not consumer end user access, but rather, well, it touches on that a little, but it's mostly about how do you permission your own staff and your own employees to access production systems and uh, deploy changes to environments. How do you do that in a way that's going to be amenable to an IT governance audit? Again, it's just one of many topics when it comes to IT governance, but it can often be the trickiest, especially if you're practicing DevOps. How do you marry agile DevOps to IT compliance? So I'm gonna illustrate this by way of some example audit findings. Suppose you're in a scenario where you've quickly moved some workloads to AWS, um, you've gone through the compliance audit and your auditor, whether it's internal auditor or external consulting partner or whoever, produced some findings, gave you a report, um, and they, they probably produced a dozen or so findings about what you put in AWS that needs to be addressed or remediated. So here's some examples. Um, the auditor may feel, it may be the auditor's opinion that you don't understand your permissions landscape. This can happen because there's many layers of permissions to think about. It's not just permissions to systems or permissions to applications, et cetera. Um, 
it can get complicated, so it's kind of an easy low-hanging fruit to say you don't understand your permissions very well, which could speak to a lack of uh, central permissions management, or it could speak to a few different things I'll talk about. Another audit finding. Developers have privileged access to production. This could be, you know, you're trying to practice DevOps, you're trying to make developers more responsible for quality and operations. Um, so how do you do that, uh, but still, you know, have your auditor be satisfied that it's under control? Uh, another sort of related finding when it comes to user authentication is internal systems when talking to each other um, lack user authentication. So this speaks to sort of zero trust architecture. Uh, it's a buzzword that's been <laughs> coming up lately, but it essentially means is your internal system should be limiting that sort of lateral movement from system to system. Every system should be gated with some, some type of authentication mechanism. So I'll, I'll show some examples of that. So let's drill into uh, these audit findings, take them in order, and, and take a design for compliance approach of how to address these. Okay, so finding one. Entitlement owners have insufficient understanding of permissions resulting in inappropriate access or incomplete access reviews. What could have caused this? Well, first of all, the auditor's kind of saying more or less, you know, um, we understand you have people who grant permission, but it feels like the people who grant permission don't have a good understanding of the current permissions landscape. Underlying causes. Um, we've seen this happen, especially with fast-moving startups, where they'll build a POC environment, and POC becomes production, um, and they try to go back and clean up the permission situation later. Another cause could be Dev staging and prod are the same environment. Um, again, it can be complicating to your auditor to understand, you know, if you're deploying dev prod and staging, let's say on the same Kubernetes cluster, uh, if your auditor's not a Kubernetes expert and you're saying, well, we're using namespaces to carve it up, it could be a little too subtle. <laughs> it's not that clear that that's a clean enough separation, especially for PCI workloads, they wanna see hard walls between uh, your dev and staging and prod. Overcrowded environments, uh, basically putting too many teams, too many different unrelated workloads in the same environment. Again, in a, using PCI DSS as, a, uh, as an example, your cardholder data environment, the audit goes easier if your cardholder data environment is cleanly separated from everything else you're doing. So we'll take a design compliance approach to uh, address this. So the first example is the POC environment became production. Uh, again, this is a situation where a new service, a new capability got built up, uh, live customers were added to it, things were kind of cleaned up and tightened up, and then that became production and maybe retroactively went back and created a separate dev environment. Um, but what happens in this situation is the permissions in that production environment uh, haven't been rebased. They, they tend to have pretty open policies and too many people with access uh, to the environment and it's hard to clean up later and sometimes it doesn't get cleaned up later. So the approach we suggest instead is uh, use AWS accounts to your advantage. Have multiple AWS accounts, one for dev, one for staging, one for prod is a very typical pattern. So you could take uh, this approach where you build up your POC in a completely different AWS account. You don't put live customer data in there, that's totally R&D environment. You build up your prototype there, you get your MVP working. When you're ready to get to beta or staging, to make a clean room version of that application stack, whatever you built, we recommend build a complete CloudFormation template of that, that infrastructure, whatever it was, application, everything, templatize it as much as you can. 
and then deploy that template into a clean room staging environment. Um, that'll do a, a few things for you. Uh, first of all, it'll prove that you've got a working template of your entire stack and the application, the permissions, everything you need to run that, which is very handy, especially in disaster recover, recovery scenarios. If you need to quickly stand up a copy of this in another region, you've got a complete working template of it. But also this practice, uh, because you stood everything up from a template in a clean room environment, you have a much better chance of this being auditable and proving that uh, this is indeed the least privileged version of our application. There's no extraneous policies or permissions floating around in here. And then you continue onward from there. So again, getting back to the idea of having multiple AWS accounts, um, we sometimes see early in the cloud journey, some firms will choose to try to have very few AWS accounts. And that's sometimes a decision from central IT or central security, assuming that it's easier to govern a few AWS accounts than it is to govern many. Um, but over time, as you add more and more teams into the same AWS account, the permissions can get really messy. Uh, it can get hard to reconcile who owns what. Uh, it can get hard to reconcile costs. Uh, of course, in AWS, you could use things like tagging uh, to separate out workloads and costs. But still, it, it, there will be corner case situations where you have roles and logins that aren't really tied to any particular workload. You're not really sure what goes to what. This can get really messy in a PCI audit situation. Again, the cardholder data environment is supposed to be this separate environment. It's really hard to prove in this picture that your cardholder data is truly isolated. What we recommend to you know, enterprises is a multi-account strategy. So you know, have a means to provision multiple accounts for your organization. Um, so how many accounts should you have? How, how should you divide them up? There's no exact science on this. It's roughly departmental. Um, and it could go by compliance again, for example, I, I, I keep coming back to PCI as an example, but you know, if you have a PCI compliant workload, it should probably be in its own AWS account. That's gonna be much easier to explain to an auditor that it's all here. Um, so having a, a, a lot of large enterprises have hundreds of AWS accounts, and we've seen more than that. Um, Prior to today, uh, a lot of companies built up their own software for provisioning AWS accounts. As you probably heard today, we launched Control Tower, which helps you do that. Um, but just in general, understanding how to govern a large fleet of AWS accounts, I'd recommend this uh, reInvent talk, which is available on YouTube, from uh, one of our FinServe customers, Thomson Reuters, discussed their multi-account strategy, how they provision accounts, how do they lay down the guardrails, and how do they link it all back up to billing. Um, I forget the exact number, but I, I'm pretty sure it was north of 1,000 AWS accounts by the time they did this talk. Uh, so it, there is work involved in, in building that machinery and you know setting those guardrails, uh, but it becomes much easier in the long run to separate things by account. And as I mentioned, today we launched Control Tower. This was announced back at reInvent. But its purpose is to allow enterprises to easily provision multiple AWS accounts for different teams, different workloads, different departments. So you can keep things cleanly separated, but have consistent guardrails and security controls in all those accounts. It becomes really important in the cloud journey early on to, to kind of get this in place and get it right. Uh, you, once you start adopting AWS, a lot of teams will come to you asking for AWS accounts. So this is really key to have in place early in the cloud journey. Also, when it comes to managing your permissions landscape at the enterprise level, it's really important to have federated login and single sign-on type login. 
the pattern you see in the upper left is the typical classic way of doing it, of integrating your on-prem Active Directory with AWS. And this is for human access to AWS. It's not necessarily for systems and scripts, but rather if humans are accessing AWS, they should be going through a federated login that ties back to your corporate directory. And that's essential for meeting that compliance control that inactive employee logins are consistently deactivated everywhere. Um, you have a better chance of doing that if you're using centralized federated uh, access. Uh, we also have a service, AWS SSO, which helps you set this up uh, with a variety of identity providers. And of course, one of our partners here on the expo floor, Okta, uh, specializes in this as well. So it's another really important thing for enterprises to centrally govern access. Um, another service we have of AWS that helps you centralize your access and controls, of course, AWS organizations. Uh, AWS organizations has a powerful feature service control policies, which are kind of like IAM policies that will span your whole fleet of AWS accounts. And what's nice about service control policies is even the root owners of those accounts can't override the policy. So this example on the screen is if you have a, a say a security admin role that has to be injected into every AWS account and you don't want the admins of those accounts uh, editing that policy, you can basically make that sort of a read-only policy from the, the SCP level in organizations. A few months ago, if you haven't seen it yet, we announced that we added more granular controls to organizations' security policies. Um, since launch, AWS organization security policies were a little more broad than IAM policies. IAM policies are very granular, uh, but IAM policies are also per AWS account. So if you needed granular policy, you had to inject the same IAM policy into every AWS account. Um, now with organizations with these new actions here, not action, resource, condition, you'll see that the SCP policies are a lot more rich like IAM policies. So again, if you have broad uh, restrictions that apply to your whole enterprise, this is the place to do it. For example, uh, if you don't allow anyone to launch infrastructure in other regions, this would be the place to do it. Okay, so that's uh, some examples of controlling permissions across the broad fleet of uh, AWS accounts and some practices around uh, you know, controlling permissions. The next example is developers have privileged access to production. So again, you know, firms that are adopting DevOps um, are trying to figure out the right model of how do we have agile DevOps, but still satisfy our audit requirements. So the auditor might state it this way, developers have been granted access that allows for migrating changes to production. Underlying causes, um, or some of the real underlying concerns is humans are deploying changes to production. Well, of course they are, but what does that really mean? It could mean lack of automation, really, where you might have situations where to really make something go to production, a human actually has to log into production and do a few moves to actually get the deployment completely out the door. Um, so we'll talk about how immutable production addresses that. Change approval is not correlated with change deployments. This is really important in IT governance is it's one thing to have logs that say what happened and who did it, kind of like the AWS CloudTrail log can tell you what happened and who did it. What most systems logs don't tell you is why, and that's really important in compliance is your auditor wants to know what was the justification, why did the change happen, and even more importantly, who approved it, which speaks to segregation of duties. 
And third, uh, you know, developers demanded production access for fire call escalations. Again, DevOps, if uh, developers are responsible for resiliency and quality, they, when bad things happen in production, it's the people who wrote the code who have to jump in there and diagnose and maybe fix it. So uh, it, it seems logical that developers have to have a method to get into production. How do you allow it in a way that your auditor is going to be okay with? So when it comes to practicing agile DevOps and uh, controlling access to production, the posture we recommend is immutable production, which can be seen a couple of ways. Uh, generally, immutable production means that uh, production changes are they, first of all, they're completely automated, done with tools. There's no humans in production changing things manually. So there's no manual changes in production. It could also mean you know, the idea of you're constantly rolling forward or rolling back, but you're not modifying things on the fly in production. But the key point there is if you can maintain the posture of no humans allowed in production, it's, it's great from an audibility standpoint. So you can tell your auditor, we don't allow humans in production, so only on exception basis. And we can show you all the exceptions right here. In this short list in the past six months, that's all our exceptions. Um, so how do you do that? Well, of course, it comes back to your CI, CD processes. Uh, making sure that everything that got into production was only done by tools and not by people. So it, it's the usual CI, CD process. Um, often in FinServe firms, they need staging to be a high fidelity copy of production. So there's an important step there of mask where they need to bring a copy of data from production into a lower environment but they have to mask out the PII data, the account numbers, and so on. So they'll use tools like Delphix and TCS Mastercraft and uh, Data Guys, et cetera, to basically pull that data from production back down to lower environments. But the idea here is that humans are really only working in the, in the dev zone, and then from staging onward, it's all automated. And usually the pattern we see amongst customers in AWS is dev staging and production are actually different AWS accounts, is a pretty typical pattern. Another view of this is looking at your CI, CD processes from the point of change approval. So you have your usual DevOps sort of virtuous cycle there of development, QA, and operations. Uh, DevOps teams tend to be small, so they leverage a lot of automation. Uh, but automation also provides consistency and auditability. So to design this for compliance, a, a critical step is something as simple as the code review. Because again, the auditor is going to ask, why did this change happen and who approved it? Um, where's your segregation of duties? So that goes back to you know, developers have privileged access to production, but yes, they can change production, but we are meeting our requirements around segregation of duties. So you can prove to your auditor that everything that went into production was, it was documented, here's the reason it happened, here's who looked at it and who approved it. And again, the automation gives you a lot of audit trails and artifacts. Uh, you know, for example, if you use uh, the AWS DevOps tools like Code Pipeline, Code Build, Code Deploy, uh, everything that happens in those tools is trackable through CloudWatch and CloudTrail. And if you can tie changes back to your JIRA tickets or whatever ticketing system you're using, Code Review, Board, et cetera, the more you can tie things back across, the more you can prove to your auditor that it's all justified and it's approved. Um, another aspect of DevOps is you need occasional you know, emergency access to production when things break. So how do you have just-in-time break glass access approval? 
um, especially if that's supposed to be a no human zone. You could have the posture of production, okay, humans can get in, but it's read only. Um, or you could have the, you know, the process of, okay, humans can change stuff, but it has to go through a ticket. But the core ingredient here of, of just-in-time access is an approval ticket system. So the flow looks like this, where basically a, something happens in production. Uh, the developer who can go in there and diagnose it and maybe fix it uh, raises an access ticket to get into production. Somebody else approves that ticket. And then what happens uh, at the approval of that ticket is temporary access is created and granted. So if you're using AWS mechanisms, what that means is you can create an IAM role that's actually named for that ticket. So temp access underscore 456, where 456 is actually the JIRA ticket ID. Um, and then you grant the role of that uh, developer to assume that role in that environment. What's gonna happen then is the developer has temporary access, and in the IAM policy, you can even put uh, a condition around when that access will stop working. So you can grant them access for, say, six hours. They go in, they diagnose, they log out. Everything they did uh, is uh, either in CloudTrail logs or in other system logs. And you can have another process pull those logs of everything they did and correlate it back to the ticket. So through this kind of process, you've completely closed the loop and you can show your auditor all your exceptions of getting into production. So you can say, yes, these three people got into production over the past six months. This is what they did. This is who approved it. This is why they did it. And here was the outcome. We have partners um, who actually built up solutions around this. So uh, amongst our partners exhibiting here, right across this floor, uh, Centrify and ServiceNow uh, demonstrate a solution where it basically follows that flow I just described where you can, if you need a temporary access to an environment, any sort of environment, you can request that access through ServiceNow and then Centrify will create the role, put the role in the environment, and grant access to that user. So if, if your shop is using ServiceNow, that's one example of how you can integrate it with your existing uh, SIEM system. Another aspect of access to production, it's a very common pattern in our industry to use jump boxes, bastion hosts with SSH. Uh, that's the, the classic way to do it. It has a couple of complications. One is uh, you have to distribute SSH keys typically. Those SSH keys are often, pers they become persistent credentials if you don't have a good rotation system. Uh, also, you tend to lose auditability from the time that the operator or developer or whoever got on the bastion and then hopped onto the end host, you kind of lose their audit trail of what they did on the end host. Now, you can solve those problems. You can centralize SSH access uh, with PAM, and you can you know, correlate the audit trail all the way back down to the end system. You could do that. It's complicated. A lot of firms don't quite get there. Uh, on the AWS platform, for the longest time, people have asked us, our customers have asked, can I control SSH with IAM? That's what I really want. So this is how you can do it on the AWS platform, is using Systems Manager, which is basically an agent you put on your instances that will give you console access through your web browser, basically. You can go through your AWS console and basically get the same kind of terminal access if you have this agent installed. And if your IAM role and the IAM permissions are aligned for you to get onto that system through Systems Manager, uh, you can get console access. The advantage of this is, first of all, it's controlled by IAM policies and roles. Uh, secondly, you don't have to run SSH to do this. 
So you don't have to open SSH ports, you don't have to distribute SSH keys. And from an auditability standpoint, from auditability standpoint, everything that person did, there's a log captured in S3 of what they did and what the output was. So it's great to show your auditors. We control, you know, we centrally control SSH access to all systems. And, uh, you know, we have a log of everything everybody did. So when you think about production access, whether it's developers, administrators, anyone accessing a production environment where customer data lives, um, as you mature over time, you might consider that to be an anti-pattern, something you want to drive down to a manageable level. When your auditor asks, okay, show me all the exceptions of production access, and you give them a list of thousands of times where people got into production, uh, that's not gonna go over well, so you have to you know, drive good practices, drive it down. Um, within Amazon, we're obsessed with weekly metrics. Uh, we run a lot of our internal meetings and processes around weekly metrics gathered on daily trending basis. So you could take this approach where you gather up a KRI report every week of how often uh, different teams and different folks are going into production environments. You could pull this data, you know, again, if you're using like systems manager, you can pull it out of CloudTrail, CloudWatch, build up a graph like this. And essentially in a weekly review, look for outliers like May 25th, why on May 25th all of a sudden there was, everyone was going in production, what happened? do a retrospective on that. And that's just one way to try and drive good practices and encourage folks to you know, use immutable production and avoid going into production if you don't have to. So here at the show, you know, we've got uh, partners who actually specialized in privileged access management. So again, you know, that pattern I talked about of centralizing permissions and providing access on a request per request basis as needed. Uh, these partners, CyberArk, Okta, Beyond Trust, Centrify. I, I looked them up, they're all represented here at this conference if you wanna go talk to them about privileged access management. Okay, so the third finding has to do, again, with internal systems lacking user authentication. And the auditor uh, might say it this way. Uh, there's internal systems lacking access restrictions based on user identity and job role. Now you might say, well, yeah, it's, it's an API, but it's only meant to be reachable by other systems. We don't have humans talking to that API. But still, um, as you know, zero trust is gaining interest, the new posture is, you know, every, every endpoint internally in your network should have some sort of user-based authentication um, instead of relying too heavily on network-based access controls. So if you have, say, an internal REST API that it doesn't have any authentication built into it, but you're controlling access through firewall rules and routing, um, still your auditor will say, yeah, but you know, what if someone could get into your network, they, they now have access to that system. Um, which, you know, related lack of authorization and authentication on internal services. Um, and it also has to do with overcrowded uh, AWS environments again. If you have too many unrelated workloads in the same environment, it can seem too permissive, too easy to have east-west movement. Uh, between different parts of your internal network. So here's kind of a network, uh, an example of a network that uh, is allowing a little too much east-west movement. Suppose, you know, you're controlling access to a non-authenticated service through firewall rules. Here you see 6423. That net mask is allowing like 65,000 IP addresses to get to reach that service. And maybe you put that firewall rule there just for one external partner who 
might be coming from anywhere in that range. Uh, still, if somebody gets in, uh, if an intruder gets in through that range uh, and they are able to compromise one of these systems, now they have a jumping off point to explore the rest of your network. So this is the situation that zero trust architecture is, is really meant to address, is how do you limit that movement? Doing it in AWS, you know, bringing that same sort of example over to AWS, there's a lot of ways to protect yourself from that situation, a lot of opportunity to mitigate that kind of movement. First of all, traffic coming off the internet You've got a variety of services, edge services with AWS like CloudFront, WAF, Shield, that will you know, protect you from a lot of the hostilities of the internet like DDoS attacks, injection attacks, and so on. Then to add authorization uh, to an API, we, uh, we uh, offer API Gateway. API Gateway offers uh, I believe it's up to 10 different ways to authorize the caller, uh, either from IAM role or uh, they can authorize through a Lambda custom authorization method. Um, so there's a variety of ways to authenticate the caller in IAM. And then you can have IAM uh, resource-based policies to even control what methods particular users are allowed to uh, call. So to arrest API, API Gateway is not only like a serverless load balancer, comes with its own load balancing, but also it does request routing. So slash login can be directed to a, a certain backend, a Lambda or a, uh, containers or EC2 instances, and slash catalog could go to a, a different you know, set of backends. So API Gateway is not only a request router, but also it provides you with a lot of opportunity to do authentication authorization without completely rewriting your API. It'll authenticate and authorize um, without complicating your backend logic. So in this scenario, an external request comes in the API gateway. Um, API gateway routes the request to a particular backend that's gonna handle that method. In this case, it's a Lambda function that Lambda function could call over to another part of your environment. So it's making a lateral move. Um, and let's say it's calling another internal API that's behind another internal API gateway. So you see lateral movement there. But what's great with service-based roles in AWS is that Lambda function actually has a role and you can authenticate that Lambda function to talk to certain methods of that internal API gateway as well. So end to end, this is fully authenticated. Same thing with uh, EC2 instances and AWS EC2 instances can also have IAM roles. And uh, if say that EC2 instance has to access a database, uh, in our RDS databases with Postgres, MySQL, you can do IAM authentication um, so you don't have to handle credentials. Uh, you can have a system talk to a database and authenticate itself as a particular system. Which gets to, uh, you know, how do you handle uh, AWS credentials? The classic way of doing it was to use the good old uh, access key and secret access key. There's still a lot of classic tools floating around out there that expect that. And you know, it's a static credential. It is, uh, you know, it, it's not super dangerous, but it, it can open up some risks that developers accidentally check that file into GitHub, uh, et cetera. So, you know, it's a pattern we, we encourage customers to avoid if you can. Uh, so how do you avoid it? Again, service-based roles, your Lambda functions, your EC2 instances can have an IAM role and you permission the IAM role to do things rather than use static credentials. For things that still require static credentials, you can stash those in AWS Secrets Manager or you can stash them in HashiCorp Vault. What's great about that is now 
the access to the secret is controlled by IAM and role-based access. So it's the role of the Lambda function, the EC2 instance or whatever, that's been permission to read the secret. They read the secret temporarily and then make the call based on, you know, it could be database credentials, Redis credentials, whatever kind of secret you need. Um, Kubernetes, for example, has its own secrets manager or at least a secrets mapping uh, that there's a way to pass your secrets down to your containers. So the pattern is you can store the secret in secrets manager or vault, you rotate it there and you pass it through to Kubernetes and then Kubernetes will pass it to your container. So you can have end-to-end -end role based access to your secrets. Another aspect of static credentials in AWS is of course IAM logins, especially if you have console login, you've got a username and a password. That password, um, if you're not using SSO, as you should be, <laughs> if you're not using federated access, you might still have logins that um, have a static username and password credential. So within AWS IAM, there is a credentials report you can download, it's a spreadsheet looks something like this, minus the color coding, but basically um, it gives you a list of all your static logins, when's the last time they rotated their password. Uh, it also tells you about the IAM uh, access key and user access key and secret key credentials. When's the last time uh, those were rotated for each user. So that's something that you, know, you want to check up on Re, on a recurring basis when you rebase your permissions. And also when it comes to password rotation in this situation, uh, in your account settings, of course, you can force password rotation. So you can force those types of passwords to automatically expire and not be usable after a certain amount of time. A lot of these options are turned off by default in your AWS accounts. So that's something you would go in and consciously turn on according to whatever your policies require. So in summary, uh, addressing these audit findings, taking a design for compliance approach to avoiding getting these sorts of audit findings is uh, insufficient understanding of permissions. What we recommend there is don't overcrowd your AWS accounts, use multiple accounts. Uh, it's basically cost free to create more AWS accounts. We don't charge by the account, <laughs> we charge by usage. So um, go ahead and create as many accounts as you want. Uh, to manage your whole fleet of AWS accounts, you wanna look at AWS SSO, centralized federated login, uh, organizations, service control policies, and control tower for provisioning a fleet and managing a fleet of AWS accounts. Uh, to live in a DevOps world and be agile and allow developers to be responsible for code and operations um, and still be auditable and compliant, um, try to adopt kind of an immutable production posture if you can, uh, you know, which basically means no humans in production unless by exception. Uh, integrate change approvals, everything that changes production, whether it's a firewall rule, a policy change, anything, uh, do it through a pipeline and try to make sure that every change gets tied back to a ticket that can explain who approved it and why it was changed. The answering the why is really important. And when it comes to things breaking in production, fire call access, uh, look for PAM solutions like the PAM partners I mentioned, uh, Centrify, Beyond Trust, Okta, etc. And for internal systems, increasingly zero trust architecture is becoming a growing expectation where uh, to limit east-west movement in your internal network, you wanna make sure all your internal endpoints require authorization, authentication. Uh, if you already built a REST API that doesn't have that in place, check out API Gateway on AWS. Pretty easy to take an existing API and put API in front, uh, API gateway in front of it with uh, authentication and 
Uh, basically, it allows you to have IM policies for your own custom APIs. And our database services, RDS, also offer uh, IAM authentication, at least for Postgres and MySQL type databases. And AWS Secrets Manager, HashiCorp Vault, uh, will provide you with role-based access to static secrets. They'll also rotate your secrets. And the IAM Credentials Report uh, will give you kind of a summary of your any other IAM static logins you have in your account. That's it. So, thank you.